Hello and welcome to Models of Atonement. This is chapter 7 of God the World's Future, the chapter on soteriology called The Work and Person of Jesus Christ. We've just taken a look at Christology, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now we're turning to soteriology, the work and person. We said there's a Christological dogma. Jesus Christ is one person in two natures. Well, is there a similar dogma for soteriology? No, there's not. Why not? I don't know. Accident of history, I guess. The New Testament gives multiple answers to one question. How does Jesus save? So, the systematic theologian, trying to be loyal to the interpretation of Scripture, has to come up with multiple conceptual models, each model answering in a slightly different way the question, how does Jesus save? Do they contradict each other? Do they complement one another? Can we synthesize them? Fasten your (laughs) seatbelts. We'll be jostled around as we try to answer that set of questions. We are taking a grand tour through systematic theology, organized roughly, following the pattern of the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. We are in Article 2, the one that begins with, I believe in Jesus Christ, and then there's a long list of items there. Both Christology and Soteriology belong to Article 2. Soteriology is the rational theological reflection on the answer to the question, how does Jesus save us? Is an interpretation of symbols more fundamental, and the principal physical symbol is that of the cross. Objectively speaking, the cross of Jesus many years ago in Jerusalem is where the atonement takes place. Your and my appropriation of that atonement, living our lives daily within the power of the symbol of the cross, is just as important as the historic event of the cross. Let's go for a couple of minutes to the Ethiopian Coptic Church, perhaps the mother of Christianity in northern Africa. The church as we know it today, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, was founded in 335 of the Christian era. And uh, the practice of the cross has developed over the centuries. Here is the neck cross. If you wear this, you have an amulet. It protects you against the evil eye. The evil eye, of course, is someone else's desire. And if their eyes turn to the cross, they are diverted from desiring things that could be more sinister. The underlying design of the majority of Ethiopian Coptic crosses is a set of arms that end with three points. There is a legend that Queen Helen, the mother of Constantine, in one of her trips to Jerusalem, found the original cross of Jesus, divided it into four parts, and spread it to the patriarchates of her era. 
Alexandria, Constantinople, Rome, and Antioch. And then as the legend continues, a portion of one of those four arms of the original cross made it to Ethiopia in the 15th century. Here is the handheld cross the priest use, uses for praying or blessing. Now, what's that little box down there at the bottom? That's the tabo, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Grave of Adam. The processional cross, usually made of a precious metal, gold or silver, brought out on Epiphany and other major festivals. And, of course, the rooftop cross to let the whole world know that we are Christian. Sometimes, in the Coptic tradition, you'll find a rooftop cross that has ostrich eggs. What is important for us theologically is that the physical symbol of the cross is basic. It is equa primordial with the Christian understanding in which the cosmic act of divine atonement for the world is appropriated to you and me so that we live our daily lives out of the symbol of the cross. The task of the theologian, whether the church theologian or the public theologian, is to render a rational interpretation of the symbol of the cross. As I said earlier, don't trust a systematic theologian. Why? Will the systematic theologian pick your pocket? No, that's not a danger. The systematic theologian sometimes uses one term with multiple meanings. The word Christology is one of those words that has multiple meanings. In its narrow scope, the word Christology refers to the person of Jesus Christ. It connotes the Christological dogma from the Council of Chalcedon, which says Jesus Christ is one person in two natures. That's Christology narrow in scope. Sometimes the theologian will use Christology broadly, comprehensively, to refer to anything you want to say about Jesus. Okay, I won't warn you when I use the word in one way or another, but for this discussion, I'll do my best to keep Christology in its narrow scope. That leaves room for soteriology. Soteriology is the theory of salvation. Jesus Christ does work, and we don't mean putting tables together in the carpenter's shop, no. We're thinking about that office in the triplex munis or the quadruplex munis, the office of priest. He does priestly work. And his priestly work accomplishes your and my salvation. So how does Jesus save us again? Philip Melanchthon gave us this phrase, to know Christ is to know his benefits. The person of Christ and the work of Christ are so inextricably tied together, you can't really separate them. Here in Soteriology, we're going to ask the question, well, what are those benefits? Here in Soteriology, we will give considerable attention to the word atonement. 
Maybe your Sunday school teacher thought he or she was clever by saying atonement is at one meant. That's actually accurate. <laughs> uh, we frequently use the word atonement to translate the Hebrew kafar, or in the New Testament, helasmos, which refers to a blood sacrifice that leads to expiation of sins. And katalage, which we translate reconciliation more frequently, in Jesus Christ we are reconciled to God. Now, just how does it work out again? Prophet, priest, and king, the three offices of the triplex munis that made it into theology and into hymnody as well. Under the rubric of Christology, we looked at Jesus Christ as prophet and king. Here now, under soteriology, we'll take a look at the priestly work of Jesus Christ. Salvation. Do we need a savior? Well, certainly the World Future Society thinks we do. The planet is threatened with loss of its ability to support life because of human sin, the choice of profits over profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S over P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. Help wanted, world saviors. What could this mean? Well, one of the tasks of the public theologian is discourse clarification. There is a lot we can learn about Jesus Christ as Savior that will help us understand the cry of the agonizing environment. Why does our ecosphere call out for salvation? Who will stand up and become a savior of the world? Well, since the Second World War, we have a volunteer. Natural science. Science saves. We could see this during the coronavirus plague of 2020 in the tug of war between corrupt politics on the one hand and the purity of our scientific, medically informed, scientific advisors on the other. If only the pure science could win over the self-destructive tendencies of the human race, then... We could not only preserve the environment, but we could come up with a cure for the coronavirus and then come up with a cure for a suffering economy. I wonder if they, the scientists could blot out all of our sin. Whew. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? Before the public theologian can offer discourse clarification in the wider public discussion of the ecological crisis, the combating of COVID-19, and the role of science in saving the human race, it would behoove us to understand more clearly what we mean by the saving work of Jesus Christ within the Christian tradition. As I already said, we have a Christological dogma formulated at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. We do not have a soteriological dogma. What we have is the New Testament telling us that Jesus saves and describing Jesus' saving work in multiple metaphors and symbols. 
So the theologian has to collect all these and bring them up into conceptual models or theories, sometimes called motifs. So we end up with multiple models of atonement, different answers to the one question, how does Jesus save? Here's my list of models of atonement. Got six. I found these six different models or motifs by raking through what theologians have said recently and in prior centuries. Each one has some biblical basis. It also has some conceptual coherence. The first one is Jesus as the teacher of truth. On the one hand, Jesus is an educator telling us truths in the plural about God. Then there is mystical truth. That is to say, if Jesus Christ and God the Father are one, if we can enjoy a mystical connection, we can enjoy a pre-articulate experience with God. Number two is moral example and influence. So in this case, Jesus doesn't tell us in words how to live, but rather because he himself gave himself out of love, you and I can copy Jesus. And then we become Christ-like. Number three, Christus Victor or Liberator. Christus Victor, Latin for Christ the Victorious Champion. And Liberator, as in contemporary liberation theology, that's a different model than the first two. Satisfaction and penal substitution. When people complain about Christian atonement, it's usually penal substitution that... uh, they're mad at. We'll take a look at those. The happy exchange, and this relies on the communication of attributes, which we discussed in the Christology voice thread. It's given to us by Martin Luther in the 16th century. Then finally, my own. The final scapegoat. We'll take a look at these six. I bet that seatbelt of yours is still fastened, okay? We're going to get jostled from one model to the other. Who knows where we're going to end up? The first of our models is Jesus as teacher. If we follow the teachings of Jesus we end up with salvation. As an educator, Jesus gave lectures. He told parables. He gave people axioms and witticisms. If you and I listen to Jesus' teachings, will that put us on the path to salvation? A second form of truth dispensing is not necessarily what Jesus says, but who he is. Jesus is one with God the Father. If you and I share a mystical oneness with Christ at a pre-articulate level, we are living in the truth, even if we can't speak the truth. Let me elaborate a little bit on what we've just said here. Probably what stands out when we think of Jesus as a teacher is the Sermon on the Mount. Take a look at the Stanford University Chapel stained glass window here. Jesus is an educator. He is teaching us about God. He is replacing Moses as the authority about God. 
So if we believe what Jesus says and take it to heart and live accordingly, we will be living in God. The most important teacher in Hebrew history was Moses. He came down from Mount Sinai and gave us the Ten Commandments. Here is the Moses Fountain, formerly on the property where Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary had been located. Students like to dress Moses for the liturgical season. So you can see the Easter eggs and the Easter bunny ears. What Moses is doing here is striking the rock at Meribah, out of which water flows. So this was actually a fountain. What is important for our first model of atonement, Jesus as teacher, is that Jesus goes to the mountaintop, as Moses did. Jesus says, you have heard Moses of old say A, but I say B. Jesus is equal to Moses in authority. Or is he even superior to Moses in authority? It's the teaching of the but. You've heard Moses say A, but I say B. Jesus is one who taught with authority. Now let's move slightly in a different direction. Instead of the content of what Jesus said as the teaching, Jesus, especially in the Gospel of John, but elsewhere too, Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. And so if you and I are attached to Jesus... We are in the truth. Let me take you to India, to Shantivanam, the ashram of the Holy Trinity, founded and led for many years by Bede Griffiths, a Benedictine monk who felt that one could take the New Testament and cap it on to the Hindu Upanishads in a way parallel to the way the Christian church had capped the New Testament on the Hebrew scriptures and the Hebrew history. Syncretism is what some might call it. Yes, if you go to the ashram of the Holy Trinity at Shantivanam, you'll find a chapel. But in addition to the chapel, you find a meditation center. As you probably know, Hindus practicing yoga will frequently recite a mantra The mantra at Shantivanam is Om Namah Kristaya. You probably can figure it out. It's Sanskrit, but Om is the most holy word in the Sanskrit language, but it's here attached <clears throat> to the name of Christ. When you walk into the meditation center here, this is what you find. This is a three-quarter life-sized statue carved out of obsidian of Jesus Christ. Note there are three of them back to back right there. Jesus is in lotus position. Jesus is meditating and experiencing the oneness 
between the Son and the Father within the Holy Trinity. And if you and I meditate, Om Namah Christaya, we will transcend our rational sense of separateness from the objective world. And in our subjectivity, we will share in Christ the way, the truth, and the life. Let's step back just a little bit and look at the logic of what is being said about model number one, Jesus as the teacher of truth. What is the human condition to which this work of Christ is the healing or the remedy? Answer, ignorance. Ignorance gets cured by education or knowledge. That is the central structure of Gnosticism. You can see noses here. That's the Greek word for knowledge. And as you're well aware, in the ancient world, the Gnostics believe that you and I are living in a realm of darkness. The physical world is a realm of darkness. So a Gnostic Redeemer comes from the realm of light to teach us the path back up to the light so we can escape the darkness. So is the first model a form of Gnosticism? No, I don't I don't want to say that in any historical sense, but it does presuppose something that the Gnostics also presupposed is that you and I are alienated from God by ignorance and knowledge is the cure. New Age Spirituality, 1970s, 80s, and 90s, retrieved the ancient Gnostic approach to salvation. I once heard a lecture by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Later on, I got to know her personally, and Elizabeth Clare Prophet said, in the ancient world, there was a battle between Gnosticism and Christian orthodoxy, and the Christians won. But today, at the dawn of the New Age, Gnosticism will win again, or win at all. <laughs> so, according to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, New Age spirituality is a form of Gnosticism. The way in which you obtain the knowledge that is of saving value, however, is not through imbibing teachings such as the Sermon on the Mount or any other set of teachings, but rather esoteric knowledge, knowledge that you get through meditation and other spiritual means in which you realize that at heart, you belong to the universe, that that spark of the divine within you needs to have some fanning of the flame so that you realize that you are at one with God, the light. So here's my point, is that the model of salvation in our list of models of atonement has something in common, at least structurally, something in common with Gnosticism and New Age mysticism. Let's go on to our next model, model number two. Jesus as a moral example and influence. This is still somewhat of a teaching model, but 
it has some unique features not already in model number one. Peter Abelard, early in the 12th century, argued that you and I, naturally, through our reason, want to pursue the good. What we need to know is what the good is. God reveals to us what the good is in the life and the passion of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved self-sacrificially. That is the way to be godly. So if you and I copy Jesus and love self-sacrificially, we will be living in God. The great philosopher Immanuel Kant enjoins us, invites us to pursue this ideal of moral perfection, to pursue this archetype of the moral disposition in all its purity, and for this, the idea itself, which reason presents to us for our zealous emulation, can give us power. And, says Kant, once we voluntarily engage in the, in the moral activity that copies Christ, we may hope to become acceptable to God and be saved. We copy Jesus we become accept acceptable to God, and we attain salvation. Liberal Protestants really like a combination of models one and two, Jesus as teacher and Jesus as moral example. When we get to the 1920s, liberal Protestantism in America would talk repeatedly about the ethics of Jesus, the Christian ethic, as the way to transform society and bring the kingdom of God to bear on North American democracy. Do you ever sing this hymn, O oh, Master, let me walk with you in lowly paths of service true? Tell me your secret. Help me to bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. O oh, Master, let me walk with you is midwife to the birth of liberal Protestant Christianity in the United States about 1885, Washington Gladden, pastor on Broad Street, downtown Columbus, Ohio. There's a march, a labor march against management. Pastor Gladden is part of the march, and in the middle of the protest, he sits down on the curb and writes this hymn. Oh, Master, let me walk with you. You provide the example. I am the follower. Bumper sticker with WWJD question mark on it? If you do, here is its origin, 1897. Charles Sheldon 
writes this book in his steps, Sheldon is on the front end of the development of liberal Protestantism in America. Oh, yes, I know. It's This book is sold in evangelical bookstores, but they don't realize it's a liberal Protestant document. We have labor unrest in the 1890s, and Sheldon is calling the Christian churches to a public responsibility, a public responsibility to the workers, factory workers, who are getting badly dealt with by management. Liberal Protestantism and the labor movement have had a close relationship for well more than a century now. What would Jesus do becomes the moral and ethical quandary every time we confront a problem, a social problem, public problem, spiritual problem. Jesus is the example. We're going to follow it. In August of 2020, President Donald J. Trump was campaigning against his rival Joe Biden, and in one statement he says, Joe Biden doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in guns. God and guns? How did they come together? I... I don't see the logic of it, even though others do. Former President George Bush delivered one of the eulogies at the funeral for Congressman John Lewis, July 30, 2020. Here's what the president said about the congressman. There's a story in the old scriptures that meant a lot to John Lewis. In the Hebrew Bible, the Lord is looking for a prophet. Whom shall I send, God wonders, and who will go for us? Isaiah answers, here am I, send me. John Lewis heard that call a long time ago in segregated Alabama, and he took up the work of the Lord through all his days. The liberal Protestant ethic fights for racial equality, and John Lewis, one of the great civil rights workers, both during the Martin Luther King era and later in the U.S. Congress, devout Christian, saw his task as one of public transformation, follower of Jesus, the great moral example. Here's another hymn that embraces model number two. Jesus is the moral example, but there are shades of model one, the teacher. I am the light. That's the teaching metaphor. Jesus is the light. He provides the way, but the godly life displaying. Jesus is the moral example. I bid you walk as in the day. I keep your feet from straying. I am the way, and well I show how you should sojourn here below. Let's uh, pause here for a moment and make a theological assessment of these two models, as I've mentioned, yes, Both of them have scriptural origins, and both of them have an internal coherence. 
But if Jesus is both a teacher and an example, that turns you and me as Christian believers into disciples, followers. Nobody's going to dispute that. But should they be considered atonement models or not? Lutherans do not like these two models of atonement. Why? Because... For all practical purposes, they're models of self-salvation. Oh yes, Jesus shows us the way, but we save ourselves by following the way. And the Lutherans are going to want to emphasize that atonement is an act of God out of God's grace and love. Let's turn now to model three. We've got Christus Victor Christ, the victorious champion, uses the symbolism of the military, the soldier, the victor in battle, and the liberator. The difference between these two is that in Christus Victor, you have a loser. It's in death and the power of the devil. They lose. In the case of liberation, everybody wins. Lutherans are going to really like Christus Victor because the victory is totally and completely the product of God's grace. God fights on your and my behalf. In the Easter resurrection, God declares victory over death. Sin, death, and the devil are defeated. When God raises Jesus from the dead. Let's pause to add just a little detail on what we mean by resurrection. In the gospel accounts, there are three resurrections in addition to Jesus' Easter resurrection. There's the widow's son at Nain, uh, the healthy young Man is being carried to his funeral on a bier, and his mother is left without a social security check. Jesus raises the young man and sends him home to take care of his mother. Uh, there is the resurrection of Lazarus, and um, that makes all Jesus' friends really quite happy. Then here we have Jairus' daughter, the 12-year-old girl. She's dead. The family is wailing in grief. And Jesus says, oh, no, she's not dead. Let's just wake her up from her sleep. And then he tells her to go and do his homework. Now, what these three miracles have in common is that the beneficiaries of Jesus' miraculous power get raised from the dead, but they will have to die again. They are raised to ordinary life. Jesus, in contrast, on Easter Sunday, is raised to eternity. So also, the resurrection that is given to us That resurrection is a resurrection to eternity, not a return to ordinary life. This method of looking at parallel models of atonement is one that was given to us by Gustav Allais, neo-Orthodox theologian at Lund University between the two world wars, 
Somewhere in the 1930s, he gave us this very influential book called Christus Victor. Aulain compares three historical models of atonement. The first one we've already looked at, that's the moral example model. Uh, the second one we'll look at in a few minutes, that's the satisfaction model. And then the third one is Christus Victor, Christ the Victorious Champion. Elaine argues that this is the preferred model of Martin Luther. Well, he's partially right, but partially wrong. Yes, it is true that Luther frequently appealed to the Christus Victor model of atonement, but I will argue later, he also liked the satisfaction model as well. One of the stories that Luther tells that takes a Christus Victor form is that of the worm on the hook. He begins with the Chalcedonian Christology of two natures. The divine nature is the iron hook. The human nature is the worm covering the hook, hiding the hook. The devil is the fish who comes along, sees the juicy worm, takes a big bite, and then the hook hooks the devil. The devil has overreached and been tricked by the divine nature within Christ and this accrues to the loss of the dominion of the devil over death. Worm on a hook, Christus Victor. Are you familiar with this Christus Victor hymn? A mighty fortress is our God. Note the military imagery. Our God has a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. God is our mighty fortress and the victor in battle. In this Peter Paul Rubens painting, you can see the risen Christ victorious over the serpent. So who's the loser in this cosmic battle? Sin, death, and the power of the devil. If you are ever in Munich, I hardly recommend that you visit the Church of St. Michael and All Angels, a Jesuit church. And here on the exterior front, you see the battle from the Book of Revelation in which the monster, the dragon, Satan, is defeated in the battle in heaven. I don't think it's geographically in the heavens, but it's cosmic in scope. And once St. Michael, which is actually another name for Jesus Christ, slays the dragon, the dragon is sent down to earth in order to wreak havoc here. Up until the confrontation between God and Satan, between Good Friday and Easter, the devil had province over death. After all, death is the reward of sin. But when God raised Jesus from the dead on Easter, God became the warden of death. Here is the painting over the altar, the high altar at 
the Church of St. Michael and All Angels, and we can see the devil losing in this battle as Christ the champion wins. And you and I are beneficiaries of this victory. Take a look at this t-shirt with the Bible passage from the book of Revelation. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Put some hot coffee into your cup and relax. I want to tell you the story of how I bought this t-shirt. I had to lecture at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, right across the river from Fargo, North Dakota. When my lecture was over, it was evening, a few of the Concordia faculty and I went out for some libations and we met my good friend, old friend John, who was a religious studies professor at North Dakota State University. John and I had gone to graduate school together, remembered his dissertation was on Christians in the Roman Empire who joined Constantine's army. He liked things military. He had a pickup truck with a gun rack. And while the conversation was going on, John used the phrase, chainsaw fundamentalism. And I said, John, I don't use that phrase. I mean, that's extreme and obnoxious. Ted, you're up here in the Great Plains, North Dakota and Minnesota. We've got militias. They're anti-government. and They're armed. And many of them are religious. Chainsaw fundamentalism, that's what I call it. Well, John and I have great relationships, so we agreed to disagree. Next day, I had to fly back to my home in Berkeley, California. And somebody drove me from the college to the airport, which was in North Dakota, and we had a little extra time. We stopped at a shopping center, and I found a Christian bookstore. I went in and browsed around, and I found this T-shirt. Oh, I love this T-shirt. And I went up to the counter to buy it. It was early, like 10 in the morning, and the woman who was in charge of the bookstore had just arrived, and she was putting things away, and she said, I'll be with you in just a minute. I said, take your time. I'm not in a hurry. So finally, when all things were ready, she came over, and I handed her uh, this uh, item, and she says, do you like this T-shirt? I said, oh, yes, I've never seen anything like it. I want to buy it. <gasps> she says, I have a poster of this picture of Christ on the white horse. And on the poster, it's so much more clear. You can see that the hoof of the horse is stomping on and crushing somebody's head. I just think it's so beautiful. Well, as I reflected on that, I said, I think John was right. Chainsaw fundamentalism. Samuel Youngs in Dayton, Ohio, offers what he thinks is a distinctive model of atonement, therapeutic atonement. But as I read it, it's a psychological internalization of the Christus Victor model rather than see atonement objectively as something that happened on Calvary many years ago. The battle between Christ and Satan takes place internally within your and my conscience. It's 
Christus Victor subjectivized. Now what Young's observes, especially in Luther's commentary on Galatians of 1535, is the combative and dualistic grammar, but Young's thinks, and I, I, I believe is correct, they refer to inner internal struggles of conscience. So when Luther lists the enemies, he lists sin, death, the devil, the law, the wrathful judgment of God all together. But, you know, in your standard Christus Victor model, it is God on one side and the devil on the other. But now the devil and the wrath, wrathful judgment of God are the same thing. <laughs> So, Young's observes, and I think accurately, that we're talking about the second use of the law here, and it is internalized so that it's our own conscience condemning us. In our conscience, says Luther, the law is truly the devil. <laughs> well, um, Young speculates could we really be talking here about felt shame or the experience of despair that an afflicted conscience gives us? And so Jung says the role of the devil as an accusing voice, as an accusing voice, is blended seamlessly with our own voice. Christ does not fight the devil. No, Christ fights the law. Well, uh, looking at the uh, material below, Luther's picture here. Uh, Young's writes, Young's <laughs> writes, the law is a liar, which means that we lie to ourselves. We are deceived and broken. The law is not the final word about God, which means we are wrong about God until we are free from the law. The Father has not, in fact, forsaken Christ. He raises him from the dead. The Father does not hold wrath above our heads. He loves the world. The law, our fearful mind and sad heart, paints a picture of God that is not true. But it seems real to us. Only the gracious God shown forth in Christ is true, and that is what must become real to us if we are to be saved. It's the reality of God's graciousness revealed in Christ that defeats the accusing role of the law within our conscience, liberates us, and provides comfort. In the variant that we find in liberation theology, the enemy is not Satan, sin, death, and the power of the devil. Rather, the enemy is the oppressing class, the oppressing economic class or political class that wreaks havoc on the lower classes. And so liberation consists, on the one hand, of throwing off the chains of oppression in the class struggle, but those who get defeated, <laughs> uh, the economic forces and the political forces, are reintegrated into the restorative society envisioned by the liberation theologian. There is no permanent loser in the liberation model. So what the two of these share in common is victory, to be sure. But in the liberation version, we're not relying on permanent losers, but hopefully... There will be liberation for the oppressors as well as the oppressed and a reintegrated, restored society on the other end.
Solentiname. Spiritual Roman Catholic community during the era of the Nicaraguan Revolution. Res the resurrection of Christ is simultaneously the resurrection of our people. Unfortunately, the era of justice and the reintegrated society in which both oppressors and oppressed are liberated, well, we're still waiting. This resurrection icon is common to the Byzantine tradition. Here we find the Easter Christ in the mandorla, the football-shaped halo, and the Easter Christ is reaching down and pulling out of the grave Adam and Eve. That's you and me. Christ's resurrection to eternity includes you, your and my resurrection to eternity. I call this a prolepsis. Remember in our earlier discussion, the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits of those having fallen asleep, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. The apocalyptic resurrection of the dead has begun in the person of Jesus Christ. We only await now your and my inclusion in that resurrection. That makes Jesus Christ the prolepsis, the anticipation of what will become your and my future. Christ's victory becomes your and my victory. There are some theologians who refuse to divide between the person of Christ and the work of Christ on the grounds that who Jesus is is automatically what Jesus does. Recall Philip Melanchthon saying, to know Christ is to know his benefits. The resurrection leads to the ascension. So if the resurrected Christ isn't walking around and coming to your house for a cup of Pete's coffee, where did he go? Well, the ascension image in the New Testament is he went up to heaven. In the proleptic model, which I just shared with you, Christ went to the future. We will see Christ again when time catches up with eternity. This victory by God over death on Easter Sunday is cosmic in scope. Jesus did not return like Jairus' daughter to do his homework. No, no. This is a cosmic victory over death. Here's the Gedechnis Kirche in Berlin. Note Jesus' body looks like the victim on the cross, but at the same time, these are the hands outstretched by the victorious champion. We call this cross the Christus Rex, Christ the King. Here is a local Berkeley version of the Christus Rex. Jesus Christ is, has both a halo and a crown. This is the body position of the ruler of the cosmos, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Only the king of kings and the lord of lords could put an end to death forever. Jesus Christ, the Pantocrator. Yes, that word, Pantocrator, appears in the New Testament. 
This is as much about the person of Christ as it is about the work of Christ. And if you visit Byzantine or, in some cases, Syriac churches, and you look up in the dome, the cupola, you will find Christ, the ruler of the world, the king of the universe, looking right down at you. My doctoral student, Nate, and I had to go to the World Council of Churches in Geneva, and here in this assembly room, take a look at the wall. What do you see? Christ the King, Christ the Pantocrator. Christ Pantocrator painted on a garage door in New York City. Is this Christ Pantocrator or is it deep incarnation? Here, Jesus appears on the wall of a building in Richmond, California, and it's in a neighborhood populated by Mexican immigrants. This is a very context-specific pro appropriation of the person of Christ doing the work of Christ. In our Christology presentation, I emphasize the radical, even paradoxical, relationship between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, how Good Friday ends with disappointment and despair. Then God reverses that with the resurrection on Easter Sunday. It's not always clear in the New Testament that that sharp contrast obtains. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, is that for death or is it for life? Is there a kind of penetration of the dying Jesus? of the resurrected and eternal Christ. Now, I'll take a look at this painting by Peter Paul Rubens. I think this is in the Alta Pinacothek in Munich. I can't remember for sure. I wonder if the Johannine cross already has within it The resurrection, note how the light connects heaven and earth in the cross. I am simply awed by the surrealist art of Salvador Dali and taking a look at these two crucifixions. Could the eternal Christ be in, with, and under, and coming to revelation here in the crucified Jesus? Let's turn now to the question, what do we mean by salvation? Soteriology and atonement theory lead us to salvation. Well, soter in the New Testament means healing, and certainly Jesus' miracles included many, many healings. Take a look at this picture of Jesus, which I saw in the basement of the Heidelberger Schloss, the castle on the hill in Heidelberg, Germany, where they have a 
Museum on the History of Apothecary. Well, what we mean by that is drugstores, CVS, and things like that, where we get our healing medicines. Look at Jesus. (laughs) He's the chemist. He's the pharmacist. Is that the kind of healing that we mean by salvation? God so loved the world, we read in John 3, 16. The word for world there is cosmos. God so loved the cosmos that he sent his only begotten son, the cosmos. Are we talking about extricating those people of faith and taking them out of the world? Or... Does salvation apply to the whole of that cosmos? I took this uh, picture while I was teaching in Sri Lanka some years ago, where Theravada Buddhism, uh, an austere form of the Buddhist tradition, is alive and well. Here's Diksha. Age five. I lived uh, with uh, her family and we visited this Buddha at rest. Note the massive size of that carving. Well, if you and I were a Buddhist, would we want to say that God so loved the world? Probably not. That cosmos in John 3.16 has as its counterpart in uh, Buddhism, Pratitya Samutpada, the world is codependent, co-arising. It is not ultimately real. What is really real is nothingness. Your and my self appears to have a certain level of reality, but That's delusional. At bottom, we have a, not a self, but a non-self, a nada. And if we realize our non-self, and then we merge into the non-being, which is ultimate, ultimate emptiness, we experience sunyata. We leave this world. We don't try to save it. No. We get out while the getting's good. But once we're out, (laughs) there's no we there anymore. If we take a look at Buddhist spirituality in Thailand, it's going to look a little bit different because there's a stronger emphasis on the maintenance of this world, what the Christians would call cosmos, what the Buddhists would call pratitya samutpada. Now we are at a large temple in downtown Bangkok and take a look at the golden statue on the right. And you'll see a string leading upward from the statue. That statue is about the size of a human being, maybe a little larger. Now take a look at the photo on the left and see another enormous visage of the Buddha. If you and I are practicing Buddhist spirituality, we're going to go to the temple What are we going to do there, and why? When we get to the temple, we're going to make an offering. We will have sold something in order to buy gold. Then, when we get there, we go to a statue of the Buddha, and we lay our gold on that statue. 
And once we have exercised this gesture of piety, that gold gets translated into merit. Remember the string I pointed out on the previous golden statue? Well, that string goes up on this fishing pole-like stick on the right, and then you can't see it, but there's a long string that goes from the Temple Mount out into the world, symbolically carrying your and my merit blessed by the Buddha back into the world of Pratitya Samutpada in order to heal the world, to make the world a better place. Merit, that applies to you and me individually, but it also benefits the world. Is that what we mean by salvation? Jesus uses symbolic language such as the kingdom of God, or in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven, or the new creation. What could those symbols mean? I like to think about Isaiah chapter 11, the passage on the peaceable kingdom. This is not... Pratitya Samutpada, from which we escape into Anada. No, this is a transformation of the cosmos, a change in the laws of nature. It is a new creation that transforms the present creation. Well, let me read some verses from Isaiah chapter 11. They're probably familiar to you. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now that is highly symbolic language. But when you and I as theologians think about What is salvation? I wonder if this is what we have to interpret. Let's turn to model four, the satisfaction theory of atonement. Within this, we're going to discuss the penal substitution model, which I see as a subcategory within satisfaction. And when people these days get mad at the Christian tradition for atonement, it's usually penal substitution they have in mind. So let's try to get clear on this model that answers the question, how does Jesus save? Fill your cup with hot coffee and refasten that intellectual seat belt. We're going to Canterbury and pay attention to what St. Anselm said when he gave us the satisfaction theory or model of atonement. He wrote a book called Cordeus Homo. Why did God become human? He actually has Muslims in mind here who deny 
<clears throat> that uh, we can have a trinity, that we can have a son of God, and the grounds that Allah is one and only one. So Anselm wants to provide a rational explanation for the incarnation. Where does he begin? God creates the world in an orderly fashion. Metaphysically, the world is structured according to the principles of justice for the purpose of making it possible for all creatures in creation to enjoy felicity. We would call that fulfillment or flowering today. So justice leads to flowering. So imagine the cosmos is a great big machine for justice. But the human race, by willing to perform sin, breaks the justice of machinery, like sticking a stick in the spokes of a bicycle wheel so it won't go around, or removing the gears in a Swiss watch. No longer, because of human sin, can the universe operate according to these principles of justice. Well, God, being gracious, wants to fix the machine <laughs> so that it will continue to contribute to human and creaturely felicity. How can that be done? Well, the word satisfaction is the word for fixing the machine. Justice, which is Anselm's word for order. Justice requires that any deviation of our human will must be balanced by a deprivation of blessedness. Sounds fair, right? The imbalance can be righted in one of two ways, either through punishment and denial of blessedness or through an act of satisfaction whereby an offering is rendered up that is greater than the act of disobedience, either satisfaction or punishment. Now, this is going to be important later when we get to the penal substitution version of this. God, says Anselm, does not want to follow the road of punishment because God's purpose is to bestow blessedness, felicity, or what we would call flowering. Therefore, God chooses to make satisfaction, that is to say, to fix the machine <laughs> uh, that uh, operates according to the principles of justice and leads to blessedness or felicity. Well, once uh, God has made this commitment to satisfaction, this leads to a dilemma. On the one hand, unconditional forgiveness is not an alternative because such an act would introduce further irregularity into the universe. On the other hand, we're still talking about the dilemma. No member of the human race can offer any satisfaction to God because each human is already under the obligation of total obedience, which we've failed to meet. If total obedience is already required, then there's no extra moral or spiritual capital available with which we can redeem ourselves from our past or future sins or to make the cosmic wheels of justice turn again. Therefore, says Anselm, Unless something drastic is done about it, the whole human race must suffer the punishment produced by a disharmonious universe. Now, it's not punishment from God. It's the loss of blessedness due to the malfunction of the wheels of justice. And therefore, you and I will fail 
to attain our blessedness or flowering and then God's purpose in creating the world in the first place would be frustrated. Well, um, up until this point now, we've been operating under the assumption that God loves us. That's why the just world was created, so that you and I would be able to be blessed and enjoy felicity. But now this question of divine power comes into play. Ansel moves to a second phase in the argument. He introduces God's omnipotence. It would appear that God's purpose for creation has been frustrated by the broken <laughs> order of justice. But this is impossible because God is omnipotent, right? Therefore, a means of redemption must exist. This is a deductive, rational argument. There must be a means of redemption. The offering for satisfaction ought to be made from the human side, but since we humans have nothing to offer, it cannot be made by us. But God is capable of making such an offering because only God is able to make the offering that you and I as human beings ought to make. It must be made by a combination of the divine and the human. So he is rationally demonstrated why the warrant for the Chalcedonian one person in two natures. Anselm concludes that the incarnation is necessary. We now can answer the question, Cordeus Homo, why did it become human? At this point, then, Anselm turns to tell us the gospel story. The incarnate Son of God freely offers up his sinless life to death in honor of God, but death is a form of punishment to be incurred only as a result of sin. Therefore, Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross is an unwarranted deed that the Father cannot allow to go unrewarded and because the son needs nothing for himself, the reward accrues to the advantage of those for whom the son dies. That's you and me. Satisfaction has been accomplished. Well, take another sip of that coffee. You've just been on a rough ride. Anselm's satisfaction model had a big influence on medieval Christian piety, and yes, Martin Luther did embrace this theory. When we get to penal substitution, we'll see a little variant. Remember, for Anselm, it's either punishment or satisfaction. The penal substitution theory doesn't quite maintain that distinction. Let's take a look at John Calvin. As with Anselm, the father destroys the force of sin when the curse of sin was transferred to Christ's flesh. Here then is the meaning of the saying, Christ was offered to the Father. Okay, now, offered to the Father. For Anselm, Christ is offered to the machinery of justice and the cosmos. Now, Christ is offered to the Father as an expiatory sacrifice. That's a blood sacrifice. That when he discharged all satisfaction, okay, so he's working out of the Anselmian model a couple centuries later, but the satisfaction now is made by the expiatory sacrifice to the Father, not to the system of justice. 
Through his sacrifice, we might cease to be afraid of God's wrath. Note, the denial of your and my blessedness or felicity is due to God's wrath and not to the disruption of the cosmic structure of justice. We are now in the penal substitution matrix, a derivation of the satisfaction model, but now Christ gets punished because the Father demands expiatory sacrifice in order to assuage or appease the divine wrath. This is a bit more of a personalized version of satisfaction, but the key thing to note is that we're now exacting punishment against Christ so that punishment does not accrue to you and me. Even though John Calvin eloquently articulated the penal substitution model that has had a great influence on American Christianity, he didn't invent it. It was, it was around for quite a while, and to some extent we can even think of Anselm as having objected to it by restructuring the satisfaction model. Take a look at this uh, 11th century hymn, which we still sing today. For the sheep the lamb has bled, that's expiatory sacrifice, sinners in the sinner's stead, so Christ is our penal substitute. Christ the Lord is risen on high, Easter, now he lives no more to die. Should we Christians believe in sacrifice, that somehow there exists a mechanism whereby if we make a sacrifice that God is obligated to respond to that sacrifice with a, an appropriate reward, meet St. Simeon the new theologian. Well, he was a new theologian a thousand years ago. One person of the Holy Trinity, namely the Son and Word of God, having become incarnate, offered himself in the flesh as a sacrifice to whom? To the divinity of the Father and of the Son himself, and of the Holy Spirit. It looks like this sacrifice is aimed at all three persons of the Trinity. In order that the first transgression of Adam might be benevolently forgiven for the sake of this great and fearful work, that is, for the sake of this sacrifice of Christ. Christ's sacrifice is a work that produces something, namely your and my forgiveness. Recall how in Anselm's satisfaction theory, the doctrine of creation includes the structure of a universe that's organized around the principles of justice because it is justice that leads to human flowering and felicity. The penal substitutionists also rely on a universe structured according to the principles of justice. Faustus Socinus thinks at least the penal substitution version is incoherent. It would be unjust for God to punish Christ 
an innocent person in our place. Why? Since the penal substitution model affirms that God is perfectly just, and if Jesus is innocent, then the theory is incoherent. God's justice would prevent taking an unjust act in order to fix a broken system of justice. Let's introduce the term necessitarianism. Our question is, is sacrifice necessary? The necessitarian answer says that the obstacle to humanity's redemption lies in God. In the Anselmian view, remember, God creates a cosmos organized according to the principles of justice. When it gets broken, there are two ways to fix it, satisfaction or punishment. God elects satisfaction, not punishment. In the penal satisfaction, or I'm sorry, penal substitution model, punishment in your and my stead becomes the means whereby a God accomplishes redemption. There is a non-necessitarian version of penal substitution. In this case, it's not necessary, but God freely chooses to sacrifice Jesus Christ because it is consistent with God's attributes. God is both just and loving. Meet Eleanor Stump, one of the world's great classical philosophers. She does not like the necessitarian position, the position that makes sacrifice necessary, whether it appears in the Anselmian satisfaction model or the penal substitution model. My, does she have a lot of complaints. Substitutionary theories fail the deal with a forward-looking problem of human sin because the human proclivity to sin is not removed simply by Christ paying the penalty for past sin. Another one. These models fail to deal with even the backward-looking problem of human sin, because having an innocent person suffer the penalty incurred by one's own sin does not expunge one's shame for that sin. If we're going to talk about the human condition that needs redemption, shame belongs to the human condition, and the substitution models don't handle the issue of shame. These models fail to explain why others might still be warranted in requiring that the wrongdoer undergo punishment. So even if you forgive the sinner, you still put them in jail, right? Fourth, these models fail to address the issue of the suffering of the victims of human wrongdoing. So, Eleanor, Get rid of the necessitarian model, which applies both to Anselm and penal substitution. William Lane Craig, philosophical theologian at Talbot in Houston, he's going to defend what John Calvin and Thomas Aquinas defend, that Christ's passion and death are an expiatory sacrifice offered to God on behalf of sinners. Our sin and guilt are said to be expiated by Christ bearing the suffering that we deserved 
as the punishment for our sins, thereby satisfying God's justice and affording the basis of God's pardon and forensic declaration of your and my righteousness. These debates about the viability of the satisfaction and penal substitution models are as alive today as they were four or five centuries ago. Rebecca Parker, a distinguished feminist theologian at the Graduate Theological Union for many years, is among those feminists who want to critique the atonement in Christian tradition. And as she formulates her critique, we'll see that it's quite specifically aimed at the penal substitution version of satisfaction that we find in John Calvin. The image of God the Father, not the Trinity, we see in St. Simeon, demanding and carrying out the suffering and death of his own son. The father, out of wrath, demands self-sacrifice from the son. What does that sound like? It sounds like family abuse. And this Christian model of atonement helps sustain cultural support for family abuse and justifies the abandonment by the wider society of the victims of abuse and oppression. And then she goes on, until this image is shattered, shattering the penal substitution image, will be almost impossible to create a just society because of the Christian influence on the wider society. The Christians got to get rid of penal substitution so that we can have the kind of social reforms that protect innocent victims of family abuse. That's the feminist critique. What are your thoughts about that? Meet Merritt Trellstead. Like you, uh, once upon a time, she took this course in systematic theology in Berkeley. She's now a professor of theology at Pacific Lutheran University. Merritt will grant to Rebecca Parker that Christian symbolism can contribute positively or negatively to family relations, and hence we want to be careful not to reinforce patterns of family abuse. But what Merritt adds is her awareness of the multiple models of atonement, such as we're discussing right here, the cross symbolizing only penal substitution is much too narrow. So she wants to take the suffering of Christ on the cross and put it in a larger context, namely the love and grace of God the Father. God the Father is not an abuser. No, by no means. In fact, God the Father has established a gracious covenant with you and me in creation and all of creation that will result in redemption. I argue, says Dr. Trollstead, that the cross must be understood in a wider context, that of God's covenantal grace and promises. And this will help serve to prevent the overglorification of suffering on the cross. For this reason, it may more adequately, I like this more adequately because that 
fits the theological method that we've been working with here, more adequately address the lives of women in abusive relationships. Do you like what Merritt has to say in response to the feminist critique? Very thoughtful. You have heard me say, and I will repeat it, that I do not believe there exists at the metaphysical level a mechanism of sacrifice. I do not believe there is a sacrifice that you and I as human beings can perform that automatically triggers in God a response so that God's grace is delivered as a proportional response to the sacrifice. I don't believe that mechanism exists. Yet, it is the case that the symbolic discourse of the Bible describes Jesus in sacrificial terms. The penal substitution model seems to rely on that sacrificial mechanism, which probably doesn't exist. Well, here in Pathios, we find an online article that deals with the seven reasons why Jesus was not sacrificed for your sins. Gee, right on our subject matter. And this author, Keith Giles, has the penal, uh, penal substitution model of John Calvin in mind. Okay, now note the kinds of arguments. They're sort of like biblical arguments. Well, number one, sin offerings had to be female, not male animals, according to Leviticus 4.32. But if he brings a lamb as his offering for sin offering, he shall bring it a female without defect. So what Giles is doing is he's going back to the sacrificial pattern of the Old Testament, which seems to set the terms for an effective sacrifice, and then measuring what Jesus does over against those terms. And Jesus' death on the cross does not match these terms. Number two, sin offerings could not have any wounds, according to Leviticus. Well, Jesus had blood holes in his hands and his side, right? Number three, sin offerings had to be taken to the priest and offered on the altar inside the temple. Well, Jesus' death was outside on Golgotha. Number four, human sacrifices for sin were abomination according to God. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. Uh and then there are a number of passages for that. So let's go on to the uh, next slide here. What is the fifth reason Giles gives that Jesus could not have died for our sins? The Old Testament says God does not allow anyone to die for the sins of another. Jesus died for our sins on the cross? Huh. All are accountable for their own sin. Oh. If a sacrifice means that we do it on behalf of our own sins, well, Jesus' death on the cross was on behalf of somebody else's sins. The sacrifice that took away the sins of the people, though we're going back to Leviticus now, was not part of the death. When we get to the scapegoat mechanism, recall that the scapegoat who bears away the sins is not sacrificed. No, all the scapegoat is sent out into the wilderness. So Mr. Giles basically demolishes any attempt to use the Hebrew scriptures 
as evidence that a sacrifice took place on the cross on Jesus's part that was efficacious for manufacturing divine forgiveness of our sins. Why then, if such a mechanism of sacrifice doesn't exist, why then can Christians say with confidence that our sins are forgiven? Giles says our sins are forgiven once for one simple reason. Jesus forgives us. Or we could say, uh, because of Jesus Christ, God forgives us. But it's a free gift of God's grace. The sacrifice of Jesus doesn't arrest from God a forgiveness that God does not want to give. Oh, no. The forgiveness of our sins is a gift of God's grace. We may use sacrificial language as one of the models for describing the work of Christ, but don't think that requires a cosmic sacrificial mechanism. But when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Does the shedding of blood in sacrifice function in our relationship with God to take away our sin. Blood. If we go back to the ancient world about the time the Old Testament was being written, there were two thoughts about the essence of life. One was breath and the other was blood. When God creates Adam in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, God makes the human form out of clay or dirt or soil and breathes in the divine breath and we become a human being, a nefesh haya. So air, essence of life. Without it, you're dead. Similarly with blood. If you bleed out, you're dead. Without healthy blood, we cannot live. To shed blood is to shed the most precious life-giving force in our bodies. There's a long history of blood sacrifice. Usually it's an animal. In some cases where human sacrifice is common, it is thought that the shedding of the blood of either the human or the animal will appease the deities who are bloodthirsty, and this will lead to prosperity on the part of the sacrificing community. There's a kind of mechanism or a contract between the gods and the sacrificers. In Christian atonement theory, should we rely on the sacrificial mechanism 
Is the God of Jesus Christ bloodthirsty so that it's your and my responsibility to give God whatever blood God wants to satisfy that bloodthirst? Is that what happened in the death of Jesus? Yes, there's no question that Jesus shed blood and when you and I share in the sacrament of the altar and we drink the wine and eat the bread of the blood and body of Jesus Christ, we are sharing, physically sharing our existence with Jesus Christ. But is there a mechanism, a machine, a principle, a contract? that God is bound to, that is somehow triggered by the death of Jesus or by any sacrifices that you and I might make. In order to have atonement, must we rely on blood sacrifice? The adoration of the mystic lamb. <clears throat> what is that lamb doing? Oh, here it is. The blood of the lamb is something we share in the communion cup. The cup of salvation, as the Reformed tradition would call it. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Is the shedding of blood efficacious? Here's Indira Gandhi. Prime Minister of India, before she was assassinated, she had anticipated that something might happen. If I die today, every drop of my blood will invigorate the nation. The shedding of her blood will invigorate the nation of India. Does there exist a metaphysical mechanism of some kind or another that translates the shedding of blood into efficacy for transformation? Well, when we pose questions like that as a public theologian, we're trying to engage in discourse clarification based in part on what we've learned from our own tradition, which includes the symbols of blood sacrifice. More discourse clarification. <clears throat> Robert John Lewis died in 2020, and his funeral was held at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta a church where Martin Luther King Sr., Martin Luther King Jr., and other leaders in the American Civil Rights Movement had been pastors. During her prayer, Bernice King gave a long and dramatic prayer which included a reference to John Lewis's first march 
on Selma when he crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge and was beaten by an Alabama patrolman with a baton, and that baton actually cracked his head. He bled, had to go to the hospital. He was hurt, actually, and took him a while to recover. Bernice King says in her prayer, John Lewis shed blood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge that we might have the right to vote. I had an argument with my wife, Karen. I said, look, she's stealing the Christian symbol of bloodshedding for political purposes, as if somehow or other that John Lewis bloodshedding contributed to the transformation that led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. My wife Karen says, well, it did. Actually, she's right. It did. It ramified through American society in such a way that Congress was motivated to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I think the question the systematic theologian needs to ask internally is, well, if the shedding of blood is efficacious, how is it efficacious? Is it ontological? Is it social? There are lots of people who shed blood in atrocious situations, and their blood is not efficacious for anything. It's just a downright tragedy. Why is it that in some cases, blood shedding leads to great transformations. Let's go on to the next model, the happy exchange. Huh. At first, it's going to look a little bit like satisfaction and penal substitution, but note it's happy. <laughs> What do we mean by the happy exchange? We're going to take a circuitous route to the happy exchange. A little detour into deep incarnation. Here, this Matthias Grunwald painting, the Eisenheim altar piece. was painted during a plague. Notice what we've got here. We've got the lamb prancing with the cross. That is a traditional Christian symbol for resurrection. We have John the Baptist pointing towards the Lamb of God, on the basis of his scripture, the prophets. Theologian Karl Barth loved this version of John the Baptist. He said, that's what your and my job is as a Christian, is to read the Bible and point to Christ. Mary Magdalene, in supplication and in deep grief over Jesus' death, Mary, the mother of our Lord, and John, the disciple, also witnesses to Christ's death. Now, what we've been saying about satisfaction and penal substitution is that Christ dies for the forgiveness of our sins. Is that what is going on here in this painting? My answer to that question is no. John the Baptist's fingers pointing to Christ, but when we look at Christ, 
what do we see on his flesh? The marks of sin? No. We see the symptoms of the very plague that the people of this part of Germany were experiencing at the time. So if you were a patient under quarantine visiting the chapel and you saw Christ with the very symptoms you have on your body. The message is that God shares in your and my suffering, even if it's due to disease and not due to sin. God is incarnate taking into the divine life suffering that comes from disease. Let me tell you a little story that's got absolutely nothing to do with the point we're making here, but I was in Germany as a graduate student. I wanted to see the Eisenheim altarpiece, which is in a small museum in Colmar, which is Alsace-Lorraine, and now under French-speaking rule, and I didn't know how to speak French and could get along with German, and I walked in and found the painting, and there was a little sign in multiple languages with the message, no photographs. Oh my gosh, my heart was breaking. I had my camera. I had very high speed film i wanted my own picture and there was a guard in uniform standing right by the painting oh i don't have much charm but i tried to put it on and i walked up to him and i said in french je ne parle pas français which in french says i don't speak french then I switched uh, to German and I held up my camera and um, I said, Ich möchte ein, ein Foto machen. Well, the bilingual guard had heard the French and he didn't realize I'd switch from French to German. <laughs> he turns to me and says, uh, <laughs> In German, schöne Französisch, which means beautiful French. <laughs> Did he, I, I'm sure he didn't realize he was saying it. Then he turned and he looked out the window so that I could take all my pictures. <laughs> A little moment of grace. What we're talking about here is the communicatio idiomatum, the... Communication of attributes. Is this just ontological, spirit, physical, or does it apply also to human fallenness? St. Paul says that Jesus Christ became sin, even though he had no sin of his own, he became sin on our behalf. Would that include the worst conceivable sin, thermonuclear war? Alex Gray's painting, Nuclear Crucifixion, 1980. What's going on in 1980? There's no election, at least in the United States, between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. As part of his campaign strategy to get votes, then-candidate Reagan announces that the United States could win a limited thermonuclear war against the Soviet Union, and in such a war, America would lose the lives of only 40 million people, 40 million deaths sacrificed to obliterate the enemy on the other side of the world. If you would vote for Mr. Reagan, you would be voting for a strong man who would protect you. 
from losing any more than those 40 million. Oh, there were many in the public who were outraged, but they didn't know how to articulate their outrage. Well, Alex Gray, he articulated it in this painting in which Jesus Christ gets sacrificed in the rhetoric of war. When I was a younger professor at the Graduate Theological Union, the Berrigan brothers were still very active, and we would each year on Ash Wednesday, and sometimes on Good Friday, protest weapons research at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. There would be a worship service and a march on the laboratory. I usually went to the worship services. I didn't do much in the way of uh, marching. The symbol of the ash for Ash Wednesday picked up the connotations of the ashes of an atomic bomb. The crucifixion of Christ, as you can see on this poster, picked up the connotations of those who would die from the dropping of American bombs. This is public theology. It may not be systematic theology, but it's definitely public theology at work. We have already met Niels Gregerson at the University of Copenhagen and his concept of deep incarnation. What I think he's doing here is drawing out implications of the communicatio idiomatum, the communication of attributes. Recall that Niels contends that the human Jesus is concerned about human sin, but in addition, everything that is biological, chemical, and physical as well, Jesus embodies the whole of the physical creation right down to the electron. Going the other direction, God in Jesus Christ experiences the entire domain of physicality, and that is taken up into the perichoresis of the Holy Trinity. Deep, deep incarnation. Now you'd better take another cup of your hot coffee. We're done with our little detour into the exchange of attributes and deep incarnation, and we're ready to approach the happy exchange as Martin Luther gives it voice. But watch for a sneaky switcheroo. The communication of attributes, recall, has, has to do with the two natures of Christ. Do some of the divine attributes become human and some of the human attributes become divine? That's what's at stake in the communication of attributes. But now, with Luther, it's a communication of attributes between Christ on the one hand and you and me on the other. I hope that coffee is tasting good. What is faith? For Luther, faith isn't just believing the right things about God. Oh, no. Faith is a mystical relationship between your soul and Christ. And he uses a marriage metaphor to draw out the point. 
Faith unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. By this mystery, as the apostle teaches, Christ and the soul become one flesh, Ephesians 5, 31, forward. And if they are one flesh and there is between them a true marriage, indeed the most perfect of all marriages, since human marriages are but poor example of this one true marriage, it follows that everything they have, they hold in common, the good as well as the evil. Christ is full of grace, life, and salvation. The soul is full of sin, death, and damnation. Now let faith come between them, and sin's death and damnation will be Christ's while grace, life, and salvation will be the souls. It's a happy exchange. We take our sin, death, and damnation and give it to Christ. Christ then in exchange gives us grace, life, and salvation. Truly a happy exchange for you and me as a person of faith. The feminist objection to Luther seems to take a detour around the issue of the communication of attributes and focus rather on the marriage metaphor. <clears throat> Luther is detrimental to women. Some feminists reject the bridegroom-bride metaphor itself as intrinsically hierarchical. Christ is the patriarch. The soul is identified with a woman, and all she can bring into the relationship uh, is sin, death, and suffering. Anything and everything good she possesses, she receives from her male partner. Luther is denigrating women by identifying the soul with bad things. Now, Catherine Kleinhans makes a pivot. Rather than rejecting the nuptial imagery in Lutheran theology as intrinsically patriarchal, I choose to wrestle with the tradition in order to bring forth a blessing. Will she turn to communication of attributes? No, she hybridizes the two figures, the bride and the bridegroom, Christ and the soul. Christ the bridegroom functions as both male and female, hybridized bride slash groom resists an either or dichotomy. Well, Sip a little bit on that hot coffee and watch and listen while I read this paragraph from Martin Luther and ask yourself what model or models of the atonement might be, here, be appearing here. He, Jesus, has snatched us, poor lost creatures, from the jaws of hell, won us made us free, and restored us to the Father's favor and grace. The remaining parts of this article, uh, applying to the second article of the Apostles of Nicene Creed, the remaining parts of this article simply serve to and express how and by what means this redemption was accomplished. That is, how much it cost Christ and what he paid and risked in order to win us. He suffered, died, and was buried that he might make satisfaction for me and pay what I owed, not with silver and gold, but with his own precious blood. Well, the winning vocabulary, well, wouldn't that indicate Christus Victor made us free, maybe the liberation variant on Christus Victor. 
certainly the big one, satisfaction. Christ made satisfaction and you and I benefit. How did Christ do it with silver and gold? No, but his own precious blood. Maybe there are hints of penal substitution there, but certainly not a reliance on it. Is it possible for you and me as systematic theologians to work with a synthesis or at least a collection of the various atonement models? I think the answer is clearly yes. I think every one of these atonement models has some value and belong to the work of the public systematic theologian. Model number six, the final scapegoat. You're not likely to find this model in other systematic theologies. It's one I've been trying to develop slowly, step by step in recent decades with my engagement with a French philosopher named René Girard. Keep your seatbelt fastened. There might be a little jostling going on here. As I've been saying all along, the task of the systematic theologian is to make rational interpretations of the biblical language. And the biblical language is embedded in experience and symbolically articulated and those symbols we interpret usually say more than we can rationally report. The model of the final scapegoat recognizes a large family of symbols that are constantly picnicking with one another. Sheep and lambs and the shepherd who takes care of the sheep and the lambs and the goats and the scapegoats. Here is the good shepherd pictured on a stained glass window at the Stanford University Chapel. Let me alert you in advance that in terms of the symbolic language of the New Testament, there is not a sharp line between the lamb on the one hand and the shepherd who takes care of the lamb on the other. Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God. This painting on the left is one I found at the Art Institute in Chicago. It's John the Baptist pointing to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, literally a lamb. No, well, no, of course not. Literally a shepherd of lambs. Well, no, of course not. Jesus never had a job as a shepherd. When Jesus tells us that as the shepherd, he lays his life down for the sheep, what is that? He is the lamb shedding his blood in sacrifice. Well, what makes for a shepherd? What makes for a lamb? They get all kind of mixed up, don't they? Well, maybe they're not mixed up. Maybe the problem is with you and me as theologians trying to rationally sort it out. Take a look at the picture on the right. Mission Dolores in San Francisco. When you see a lamb on a tombstone, what does it mean? It means that there's a child buried there. The lamb symbolizes the premature and sad death of a child. The Lamb upon a throne, that's what we find in the book of Revelation. Now, wait a minute. How did that lamb that got sacrificed to shed his blood 
turn up on the throne of the universe. Do you know this hymn? Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark, how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. The sacrificial lamb and the pantocrator, two very different symbols wedded together like the divine and human natures. In this large family of symbols where we find sheep and lambs and the shepherd and goats, we also find the scapegoat. If we go back to the book of Leviticus, we see how on the Day of Atonement, two goats are selected. One goat is slaughtered and the blood is dripped on each of seven altars. Then the second goat has ritually heaped on its head all the sins of Israel. Then the goat is driven out into the wilderness to fend for itself. And the symbolic meaning of atonement here is that the goat bears away the sins of Israel. It purifies Israel by taking its sin to the wilderness. Could the horizon of the scapegoat ritual contribute to our interpretation of the saving work of Jesus Christ? Keep that seat belt fastened. René Girard a French literary critic. Well, he became a philosopher eventually, but he spent years studying literature, both ancient and modern, and he discovered a pattern. Social cohesion is founded and oriented around a scapegoat. Myths that support civilizations are disguised lies that tell a story about a scapegoat and this story, from the point of view of the victors, provides the meaning, the sacred meaning that grounds social cohesion. Only later, after he had discovered this anthropological principle, this principle of human social organization, did he then turn with these hermeneutical eyes to interpret the New Testament? He reads carefully the gospel accounts. He denies that there exists a mechanism of sacrifice. He repudiates the penal substitution interpretation because God does not accept sacrifices. God does not respond to sacrifices. There is no way the human race can possibly provoke God to act in response to the sacrifices that we make. In fact, those sacrifices are lies that we tell ourselves 
in order to create the cohesiveness of communities. Scapegoats, that's his word, scapegoats function to create community. If there is a theological message from the Gospels in the New Testament, it is this. No more scapegoats. Jesus Christ was a scapegoat, and after Jesus Christ, there should be no further scapegoats. I just have to say that my ears are wide open when René Girard talks. When the book of Hebrews describes Jesus Christ in his priestly office as the high priest of Melchizedek, that is not an endorsement of the sacrificial mechanism. Rather, it's a way of saying that because Christ's atoning work is once and for all and forever, there should be no future scapegoats or sacrifices. I work on that and try to develop it in two books I've written. One is Sin, Radical Evil in Soul and Society, because I want Christ is the final scapegoat to be a mirror that shines back and illuminates your and my human condition. So I did my first exploration in the 1990s in this book on sin. I wrote for Erdman's, and Bill Erdman said he really liked this book. He selected this Magritte apple for the cover. And then Bill said, okay, now that you've done a book on sin, please write a book on grace. Well, I never got around to writing that book on grace. So recently I produced Sin Boldly. So I've got two books on sin, although Sin Boldly really is about God's grace. But both of these work on the dialectic between your and my sinful condition on the one hand and the final scapegoat model of atonement on the other. In my earlier discussion of Christian anthropology, the understanding of sin and grace, I mentioned that there are two kinds of scapegoats, the outside scapegoat and the inside. The the outside scapegoat is usually the enemy that the society has to defeat. The inside scapegoat is a member of the community whose blood sacrifice redeems and unites the community. That's my extension of the René Girard theory of the scapegoat. Now, Through those eyes, let's take a look at some rather important New Testament passages and look at them through the eyes of a scapegoat theorist. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, what? are we to do? This man, referring to Jesus, is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, we, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. So the Jews are afraid 
there will be a Roman reprisal against the Jew Jesus. How can they prevent that? That's the question the Pharisees are asking. One of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Well, that's rhetorical, right? You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. Now, Rene Girard's scapegoat theory is going to focus right there, right? How do we preserve the nation? We sacrifice one man. The death of the one man will preserve the nation. So that's the the hinge on which the scapegoat door swings. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. Community! The dispersed children of God will be united if we sacrifice the scapegoat. In this case, the scapegoat is Jesus. So from that day on, they plan to put him to death. There is more, much more, okay? So Jesus in the Gospel of John is the scapegoat to create community amongst the Jews dispersed around the world. What about the relationship between the Jews and the Romans? Huh. We get that in Luke chapter 23. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then they put an elegant robe on him and they sent him back to Pilate. That same day, Herod, king of the Jews, and Pilate, procreator of the Romans, became friends. The Jew and the Roman became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. The scapegoat creates community. All along here, I've been trying to show how the internal coherence of Christian systematic theology can lead to the responsibility of the public theologian for discourse clarification. We have just said, according to the model of the final scapegoat, that scapegoats create community. It is also the case that the Christian symbols are powerful. They elicit meaning even outside the church. Get ready now for my claim. The internal scapegoat of America is the soldier, especially the dead soldier. How does that work? Well, let's take a look. We'll start with an anonymous Lutheran pastor. When I was young, I was taught that God loves me and that Jesus died for me. I was reminded to be thankful that God sent Jesus to die for my sins. 
during Lent and into Holy Week, we lift up the death of Jesus as something he didn't deserve. He was innocent of all charges. He died that we might be saved. His death is efficacious for you and my salvation. Jesus paid the ransom. Jesus was pleased. God was pleased with Jesus's sacrifice. Okay, that's the symbol system of Christian self-understanding at work. Well, let's just move over to politics. President George Bush is giving a national address on Easter Sunday. We've got a war going on in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Let's just try to clarify the president's discourse. Good morning, says President Bush. This weekend, families all across America are coming together to celebrate Easter. During this special and holy time each year, millions of Americans pause to remember a sacrifice that transcended the grave and redeemed the world. Okay, he's got all that right, huh? On Easter, we hold in our hearts those who will be spending this holiday far from home, our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. I deeply appreciate the sacrifices. Oh my goodness, there's the word sacrifice again. We had Jesus' sacrifice. We now have the sacrifice of the troops and the troops' families. I deeply appreciate the sacrifices that they and their families are making. On Easter, we especially remember those who have given their lives for the cause of freedom. These brave individuals have lived out the words of the gospel, Greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. Well, I call this symbol stealing. Uh, that is to say, stealing the powerful symbols of the Christian tradition and applying them outside the church to American nationalism. But note in particular, Reliance on the sacrifice of the dead soldier creates American community dedicated to the cause of freedom. What is invisible here is that the dead soldier is getting scapegoated just as Jesus was scapegoated and the link is the sacrifice of the Son of God with the sacrifice of the U.S. soldier. The principal value of the scapegoat model is to give the public theologian the kind of leverage he or she needs for discourse clarification on matters having to do with social unity. Communities, social communities, are typically founded on a lie. And a close examination of the lie will show there is a scapegoat. What is revealed by the New Testament that is helpful for the public theologian is the cruelty of the scapegoat mechanism and the hypocrisy of a self-justified social order that's based on sacrifice, somebody's sacrifice, either the sacrifice of an external enemy or the sacrifice of an internal 
member of the society is treated as a scapegoat. This is because the New Testament memorializes and celebrates the scapegoat victim, Jesus, not the social order that is maintained because of the sacrifice. Gerard himself says the gospel shout from the rooftops that Jesus and all victims of the same type are innocent, at least innocent with regard to their role in the scapegoat mechanism. The written account of the four Gospels in the New Testament is, is, is there for everyone to read. The scripture reading and resulting revelation or illumination help to unmask and thereby dismantle the scapegoat mechanism. Transparency seems to have a positive effect fact on getting behind the lies surrounding scapegoating. Mark Heim, a theologian, says that no earthly sacrifice is expected, accepted, or even possible from the point of view of Christian theology. And Gerard puts it this way, God himself refuses the scapegoat mechanism. So that's kind of a revision a potential revision of what's going on in the mechanisms of satisfaction, but especially penal substitution. God himself refuses the scapegoat mechanism, at least in his own, at his own expense, in order to subvert it. Once the truth has been exposed, the lie, it becomes clear that God's will is that Jesus is the final scapegoat. There should be no others that follow. So we don't actually have a full-fledged atonement theory here. The reconciliation part is missing, but we have a far more insightful approach to the first half. What's going on with the death of Jesus? What does it reveal to us about human nature and especially human community? What does it betray about our penchant for lying as societies? to create a communal self-understanding that victimizes others as scapegoats. That's the power of the atonement model that I'm calling the scapegoat model. Where have we just been? We are on a grand tour through public Christian systematic theology, and we've stopped off at the second article. Two stops, actually. Christology, dealing with the person of Christ, and soteriology, dealing with the work of Christ. And in this voice thread, we've given special attention to models of atonement, different theological interpretations that offer differing answers to the question, how does Jesus save us? One answer is to think of Jesus as teaching us the truth. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount teaches us about God. The word disciple means student. If Jesus is at one with God, and if we are mystically at one with Christ, then we live in the truth, whether we can articulate it or not. Our second model is that of moral example. Jesus as a person who engaged in self-sacrificial love provides an example for you and me to copy. 
Number three, Christus Victor or Liberator. Christus Victor, Christ the victorious champion, defeats sin, death, and the devil. Sin, death, and the devil are losers. And the liberation version, when Christ liberates us, there are no losers. Everybody's a winner. The satisfaction model is articulated by St. Anselm has Christ making satisfaction to the broken system of justice so that justice can be restored, metaphysically speaking. A variant on that, the penal substitution model in which Christ is punished in our place in order to make that satisfaction to the Father, that's the one that so many in the last few decades have objected They've objected to the penal substitution model because it makes God look like a child abuser. Number five, the happy exchange. We get that from Martin Luther. It relies on the communicatio idiomatum, the exchange of attributes, not just between the divine and human nature of Jesus Christ, but also between Jesus Christ and you and me. Christ gives us life and salvation, and we give Christ suffering and death. Not a bad exchange. Finally, the final scapegoat. What we get in the cross of Jesus Christ is a revelation about human nature and the scapegoat mechanism and the reliance upon a non-existent sacrificial mechanism I think this one, maybe more than the other five, has value for the public theologian's task of discourse clarification. The astute public theologian knows how to make transparent what is otherwise hidden behind lies, namely the human engagement in self-justification and scapegoating. Six models, six different ways of answering the question, how does Jesus save us? Can we synthesize them? I hope so. I think it's time to put the brakes on, unbuckle your seatbelt, take a big stretch. You've come a long way. Rest a little before we drive on into Article 3.